Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Council Meeting for the 10th of August, 2022. And could I please ask Councillor Kitu to uh, welcome us to this meeting. Uh, kia ora tātou anō. Um, then <laughs> Tata so, um, as I said, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to um, members of the press, members of the public that are in attendance, and also to those that are online, members of the Foxton Community Board that are here. Also, can I uh, give a special warm welcome to um, our newly appointed group managers that are here in their official capacity for the first time at a council meeting. So, um, Group Manager for Community Vision and Delivery, David. Group Manager for Organisation Performance, Jacinta. Uh, group Manager, Community Experience and Services, Breen. And a very warm welcome to our newly appointed Group Manager, Business and Housing Development, Blair. So, nice to have you here with us. I uh, look forward to your contribution. We have no apologies, which is good. Uh, public participation, we have several people who wish to participate today. Uh, Helen Carter on item 7.2, the Fox and Pool. David Roach and Tricia Metcalf on behalf of the Fox and Community Board uh, to item 7.2, the Fox and Pool. David Roach on behalf of the Fox and Community Board, item 7.6, three waters, reform, better off funding. Brett Russell on behalf of the Fox and Beach Progressive Association, 7.2 to Fox and Paul, 7.4 proposed liquefaction assessment policy approach, 7.6 three waters reform, better off funding, and Viv Bold item 7.4 proposed liquefaction assessment policy approach, and 7.6 the three waters reform, better off funding. So we'll get to those shortly. Uh, late items. No late items. Declarations of interest. Thank you, Mr. I have um, one and a half declarations of interest. Um, 7.4, 7.5. I'll sit off the table at 7.5, but I intend, I think, to stay at the table for the liquefaction assessment discussion. Unless there's an allergic reaction to it. Uh, no, duly noted. Thank you. Okay, no others, thank you. Um, so can we then go to the confirmation of minutes? Uh, we have need to confirm the following meetings. So the minutes of the meeting of the Council held on the 22nd of June 2022 be confirmed as a true and correct record that the minutes of the in-committee meeting of the Council held on the 22nd of June be confirmed as a true and correct record and that the minutes of the extraordinary meeting of the Council held on Wednesday the 29th of June 2022 be confirmed as a true and correct record. I'll move, seconded by Councillor Allen. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Can I just also note 
uh, receipt of the proceedings of the Finance Audit and Risk Committee meeting 29th of June 2022. Uh, move that these be uh, received. Councillor Isaac seconded Councillor Kay Simmons. All those in favour? Against? Carried. And receipt of the proceedings of the Project Steering Group uh, the 1st of June 2022. Have a mover, Councillor Mitchell, seconded Councillor Brannigan. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Could I then ask our uh, first uh, public participation for today? Helen, thank you. Please come to the table. Welcome. Just sit on the middle one, or the, yeah, that one. Um, the right button is the one that you press um, so that the red light goes on and um, you're away. The right button. Sorry, Helen, the, the button on the right. That's it. Four wheels. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I don't quite know how I'm supposed to address you, but I think you're the honour and the, um, say hello. My name is Helen Cardiff and I'm a ratepayer from Foxton Beach. As a ratepayer, I would implore the council to pay the shortfall on the upgrade of the Foxton swimming pool. And let's get it built before there's another huge jump in costs. It's no one's fault the costs have risen so dramatically and it's caused by outside influences, example, COVID. This has stopped people from being able to work and and caused a shortage of materials and labour, pushing costs up. There will be, these will increase further as time goes on. The living pool is nearly at full capacity, and with a projected population growth that is coming to our area, the living pool will not be able to service the Horofanua region adequately. If the upgrade is left again, costs will become prohibitive. It's essential we have a fit for purpose swimming pool in Foxton for the health and recreation of the people, young and old. As an elderly person, I know the exercise classes offered are just ideal and it offers not only a chance to do some fitness, but also an opportunity to have social interaction with others on a regular basis. As I have aged, my health has not been as robust as it was. I have found the land-based exercise is too hard but the pool has proven to be a godsend to keep my health and fitness. All local schools, all local school pools are only for school children and only open for a short time as they are unheated. Therefore, the Fox and Pool is used by them for school sports. Where will the students go in order to learn to swim properly and safely in a controlled environment or learn life-saving life skills? New Zealand has a large coastline and its drowning rate is too high, making it essential that as many people as possible to learn to swim at any age. More people are aware of wellness and the need for exercise to keep healthy. With the buoyancy of water, exercising in the pool is great for all, including those who cannot swim or have had operations, illnesses, as well as those who suffer from loneliness and depression. I personally know that it has helped me with my heart failure. Also, for some of my friends who have had joint replacements, arthritis, etc., plus those trying to stave off old age. It is important for there to be learn to swim classes for all ages, including mums and bubs, etc. Now some thoughts on the questions raised in July's meeting. Swimming pools are a specialised area of the building industry and reducing the scope of the build to tender to a wider catchment of builders will only end up with a cheap job that needs replacing again in a few years. More cost. Putting in a spa, which is mostly paid for by a donation, will encourage patronage. Putting in a lighter, brighter office will entice people to enter the pool. If you wait and do nothing but consult with, but consult with the community again, that will only antagonise the residents and cost you more time and money. When will the roundabout end? If you wait and somebody either gets sick or injured because the pool is not fit for purpose, are you prepared for the lawsuit that could follow? 
Providing a shuttle is a good idea in theory, but cannot work in the long run. It may work for the aquasized ladies and gents because their timetable time is specific. But how many times a day will it run for all the other swimmers? There's a group of fox and knights who go to the pool just to walk and swim for their exercise. Will the shuttle be available for them also? Will it also include the schools? After all, I'm sure that children would love to take most of the day off to go to live in for a swim. So how about the council thinks about the people they represent and their needs instead of putting up barriers and get the job done? And do that last bit. Thank you, Helen. Um, any questions? Councillor Brennan. Thank you, Helen, for your, um, your pretty measured um, uh, commentary and the comments are much appreciated. My question is around exercise, equisize classes. I understand they're very popular. Yes. Um, and uh, I know a number of people go to them and, and, and talk highly of the, thing, the benefits that you've just outlined to us. Um, just roughly, any time you go, how many people would be in the pool in those we, sessions? We were getting up to 30 people, depending on the day. Um, between 20 and 30 people on a regular basis. And a lot of those people would be um, um, older generation. Um, more mature? Yes, or my, more mature. <laughs> my age and older, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, you're one of the young ones. Yeah. Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Appreciate it. Thank you, Helen. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to um, come and air your views and um, look forward to the f discussion that we will have you're shortly. Welcome. Thank you. Do Don't worry about it. Leave it there. Thank you. You're welcome. So could I invite uh, Chair David and Deputy Chair Tricia to the table? Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, councillors, and officers, and public. Yeah, on behalf of the Boxing Community Board, we have a short seat speaking rights to 7.2, um, the Boxing Pool. I'll read out our submission. The long term plan 2141 deliberation, the board and Boxing wanted the best option. A future proof all around all year round leisure facility, which was a cost of nine point four. The board was disappointed when council resolved only to replace the existing building with option two of the LTP. Now due to price escalation, the council has been asked to consider several cost saving options or to approve an extra cost based on the base swimming pool. Given the board wanted the best option in the first instance, we cannot support a further reduction in the scope of the proposed box and pool complex. Therefore, the board strongly recommends to Council to support 3.3, option 1, that Council approve the funding shortfall of $2,859,507, based on the full scope of the proposed works. This option was what Council's resolution following, following an in-depth consultation process with the public. Bearing in mind, after, at this consultation process, feedback showed the majority of people were in support of Option 1, an all-year-round leisure facility. The Board does not support reconsultation with community or re-tendering. Any further delays to the project will only result in higher costs. Monies already spent on these processes will be black hole expenses. The board does not support any detrimental cost cutting measures that will repeat what was done 16 years ago, resulting in an inferior complex not fit for purpose within a very short time, costing more money in the long run. The board does not support the closure of the pool with a shuttle service for Foxton residents. Already Levin Pool is at capacity. It will not be able to cope with its, their own particular growth, plus the growth of Foxton. Undoubtedly, Foxton needs its own pool. Now, funding. As the Horrifana expands, so does the rate bus base. Loans committed to now will not be such a burden in the future. 
as the cost will be shared by many more households as the district grows. The Board recommends to Council to apply for funding from the Three Waters Reform Better Off funding and bring this application forward to the first trance. The swimming pool meets five out of the six criteria that are set out on page 168. Contingent on Council supporting option one, the Board all agree uh, to seek community support in a recommendation to the use of Foxton Beach Freeholding Fund for up to 500,000. To conclude, the option we recommend is for Council to approve the funding shortfall based on the full scope of the work proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aren't there any questions? Councillor Jennings. Um, thank you, Trish. Um, the comment, I guess the question is if, if Council didn't um, allocate better off funding to the shortfall, um, obviously this project would need to be debt funded and, and, and you can appreciate that there are a number of cost escalations across a number of our projects that are already in the LTP. So I guess my question is, is are you, what, what are you um, prepared or willing to give up from a Foxton project perspective in order to accommodate this additional spending, potentially? So are there, are there other Foxton-related projects in the LTP that you see as lesser priority than this particular project? Yeah. Um, Without having the LTP, that you caught me on the hop a little. But out of the um, the funding from the free waters, I'm quite happy to go without the bus shelter because I think it would be far more value putting some more money into the pool. I mean, but actually, what is in the LTP? Um, without a list of them in front of me, I would yeah, I'd be difficult to say which one I'd go without. Unless you can enlighten me what's there, I'll give you a quick answer. No, I guess, I guess there's a, a range of projects. And so, for example, I'll, I'll ask it in this way. Is Do you see, uh, for example, the flood protection works that we're talking about tonight and potentially having to increase the scope of council's contribution to that project as being higher priority than this pool project? Or, or vice versa? Yeah, would you like me to answer that? This is in my capacity because then gone to the, the board. I would be wiping part of that flood protection program because I think there's an abominable waste of money on some of the items. And yes, I would go without. Um, there's two items in there that I believe would be major savings on that project that could happen. And yet, I would see that they go towards the swimming pool. It's a different. It's a little bit different because I know council in the audit paper are looking. Um, Horizons are looking for council to put another million dollars into it. Well, I think, personal view, that whole scope of that project needs to be reviewed before you commit another million dollars. Um, just, just okay. David, it's not yeah. another million dollars that we're putting in. It's a million dollars we've already committed. Yeah, yeah. But they're asking for another million on top oh, of that. No, no. Oh, I really no. I read it wrongly. Yes. So they're only asking for a million that you committed. Sorry, I just... Yeah, well, I read it. Yeah. They may well, that's right, they may well in the future ask for more yeah. money, but at this stage, we've already paid a portion of the money that we owe them, and we're today just ratifying the rest of it. Yep, okay. Well, I read it wrongly. My yep. apologies. Councillor Allen. Look, and just on the East Drainage Scheme, to be clear, um, the question was asked of Mr Roach as the chair of the Foxton Community Board, and I just need to note that it, it is not appropriate, I believe, for him to answer as an individual when he's here representing the board, because the board's position on the drainage scheme, I'm telling you up front, is different from that of the personal view of Mr Roach. So I just want to keep it really clear. Yeah. Could you really know? Yeah. Just clear, I'll just clarify that. That is correct. Um, the board position on the East Drainage Scheme, and we made a presentation to Horizons. That um, list of what we got on order paper came out, 
and I called an emergency meeting of the board. We put together, and I think we supported 5D, which um, was the go ahead with all what they had, but we didn't couldn't support spending two million dollars on the wetland. Now the board is not against wetlands. Yep. It just it's, couldn't justify. So just let's leave that conversation here. Yeah. We understand where Councillor Allen is coming from, and um, it's yeah. um, Any further questions regarding the Fox and Pool? Yes, the Jenny. Sorry, well then, can I just clarify? Because I don't think then I got an answer to my question in terms of has has the board had any conversations about ranking or prioritisation of projects within the, the within the Fox catchment? This um, this consideration of options came out on the audit paper um, after our briefing, and I think it was just late last week. So we haven't been together between COVID and people having operations to actually discuss this ranking. We've, we've done it via phone calls and emails, but we haven't really debated it properly. Councillor Al, I just want to make a statement and, and then I want to ask the Chair of the Board whether the statement is a correct one. Is it normal at this time during the cycle, the LTP or annual plan cycle, in fact, for the board to undertake such work, to sit down and look at priorities, or is it correct to say that that job of work happens later in the business of the board? And in that sense, is the question from Councillor Jennings really an unfair one? Yeah, as I said before, had I had uh, known, we could have workshop the priorities, we haven't had the opportunity to workshop it since it's been adopted. And it would have given us a clear indication we supported what was presented to us regarding the pool and the cost then was supported. But um, to go through now and look at, I'm more than happy to put that on the audit paper and whether that supports council. It won't help tonight, but it would help. And yes, you're correct, there should be actually a review of the LTP and just workshop it through because then we need to know what priorities and what list. But I, for me, I don't think there was anything, well not me, the board, um, anything that would I'd, you could leave out that would worth $2 million. I didn't think there was anything of that magnitude on there. David, just can just confirming, the members of the Fox and Community Board did attend the workshop that we had around the options regarding the Fox and Pool. Yep, there was Mr. Metcalf and myself were here. Yep. And then officers at the last workshop, officers presented to the rest of the board. Okay. The workshop that was held here was only the two of us. And then the last workshop, which is three, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, was um, officers... Mr Harvey came along and so that briefed the board on the full cost. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can stay if you like, David. Thank you, Trish. And uh, go on to your next item. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, I didn't write a lot down on the next item. But I um, looked at the funding and I think that the priority... The pool is far more priority. There's not enough projects on there that you could wipe out. You'd wipe out a lot of projects, small ones, for your million dollars. The Boxton pool has got the red line on it, which is really the second take of funding. That's where it sits. We're, what we are requesting of council is to bring it forward to the first round of funding. It is a job-ready, shovel-ready project and could be Set going where um, some of the other projects there are only in a planning stage. Some of the red line ones, orange. even orange or red on my photo So I'll yeah. just ask the chief executive to explain why it's orange. Um, it's not red uh, because it wouldn't have made that list if it was red. Okay. All right. The orange, my photocopy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, just to kind of um, further advice to council. So a reminder that there were some items that on the night of kind of initially seeking guidance from council, 
Uh, my advice to you was it wasn't appropriate that you had that discussion about the aquatic centre because um, of the risks that that then turned into predetermination around your decision around the Fox and Aquatic Centre. And so hence why you're seeing asterisks against it, that is to acknowledge that um, you know, that is a discussion and a decision that council will need to make. But um, first and foremost, you need to make a decision about um, the Fox and Aquatic Centre future. Well, my, yeah, that was my... Because you have to find the money somewhere. You're either going to borrow it or it has to come from somewhere. And my suggestion was the funding from that. That's really where I'm coming from. And like there's a set in our um, briefing that meets five out of the six criteria on the on the audit paper. Okay, okay so, so you're essentially advocating that the Fox and Pool be upgraded to a green, green. Um, green. project. Yep. Okay. Understood. Brilliant Dorset. Anyone got oh, aren't there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Brent. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for enabling me to be here. So, Your Worship, uh, councillors, uh, council staff, Kira, uh, what I'm about to say may be slightly topical. In fact, I go as far as to say it's controversial. Uh, back in 2007, council officers sabotaged the successful design of the swimming pool. Why so, sabotage? Sorry, Brett, um, let's just keep the emotive language out of that, um, because none of us were around in 2007, so I'm not going to denigrate past no, decisions that were let made. Let me quote from the document you have in front well, of you. Well, just, if you wouldn't mind just removing the word sabotage then, uh, because I don't think that's appropriate. All right, I will use another word then. They obstructed. Are you comfortable with me to use the word obstruct? Obstruct. Obstruct. Well, what I'm asking you to do is not to... Um, Sir, please do not put words in my mouth. No, well, I'm, 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 what I'm asking you to do is not malign previous decisions made by previous council staff. All right. Okay, I'll take it on board. Thank you. I will point out that the successful design of a satisfactory swimming pool was not enabled by critical future-proofing elements being eliminated from the original design. That's a factual statement in the report. So unwarranted shortcuts were made. To me, it's a bit like a car being built with a body, an engine, wheels, but no brakes. It does not behove anybody to drive a vehicle like that, of course, because it's the only way of stopping it is to hit a wall or an object. So the, various, the report highlights the various issues, lack of ventilation, condensation, lack of bracing, lack of um, ventilation, and so knowing that the faults were there, Council then uh, extended the use of the pool from five months to eight months, even knowing that there were shortfalls and people were noticing the deterioration of the building. I do acknowledge that there's a lot of life left in these assets, and I'm pleased to say that I support 100% the two previous presentations. Um, what concerns me are some of the costs associated with uh, putting the pool right, or in fact establishing it as it's noted um, later on in the agenda as an aquatic facility. The cost 2.7 million, I think, well, 2.6 was 2020. One of, the, uh, one of the opportunities is 5.7 million, and that's gone up in two years. Inflation is quoted at 12.5%, um, I think, in one aspect of the document. Uh, it's more like 7.3%. Um, my, my thoughts are that we need to retain the pool. It's a valuable community asset for the reasons outlined previously. 
um, and to suggest that money should come from the Foxton Beach freeholding account is inappropriate because the Foxton Beach freeholding account has been used on three occasions to invest in assets in Foxton, those assets being the, um, the, the Foxton pool, number one, number two, the Tans building, and surprise, surprise, in your document, it talks about after five years of tenants building needing a new roof. Now that's not a good use of ratpayers money. We should have quality construction in our location. I mean, a, a house has a 10-year warranty. The, the tenants building was built on top of what was Mitre 10, and now it needs a new roof. I mean, for goodness sake, getting it right is really important, so it upsets me greatly that we're having to go back and get more money to do these things. Do it right first time. So um, I do support very much um, the Jaffa orange being turned into go ahead green. And if the government has made money available to council as part of the three waters, why not accept it? Why not use it for something productive like this great community facility we've got at Foxton Town? In terms of um, the other items, I'm keen to move on uh, to the... Um, Rick, can I just ask if there are any questions that sure. anybody councillors have regarding your submission on the Fox and Pool? Yes, Ralph. Yeah, so just for absolute clarity, Brett, you are opposed to any contribution from the Foxton Beach freeholding account towards the rebuild of the pool? When there are other clearly available sources of funding available, yes. So because you are already, opposed to it? We are, yes, because one's bitten, twice shy. So you are opposed to it? Yes. Are you the chair of the Foxton Beach Progressive Association? Yes, I am. Have you discussed the matter with the association, or is this a personal view? It is my personal view. Do you intend to discuss it with the Progressive Association? I'm happy to discuss it at the, with the association. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Mason. Um, Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, just uh, further to Councillor Allen's question. Can I just clarify, Mr Russell, are you here today in your capacity as Chair of the Foxton Beach Progressive Association? I'm wearing two hats. So, yes. Uh, I just would like to seek some clarity from the Chair, because that's really difficult for us. In that case, I'm here as the capacity as the Chair of the Progressive Association. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that question. So... Uh, you have not taken a question to the Fox and Beach Progressive Association about the potential use of funds from the Fox and Beach Freeholding Account and, and where they support. Not since having the timeline with the papers and the agenda for this meeting, I have not. Thank you. So, supplementary to that... You're here today as the chair of the Progressive Association. Correct. You expressed a view of opposition towards the freeholding account being accessed for the pool in your capacity as chair of the association, yes. but you have not discussed the matter with the association. Are those statements all correct? They are correct. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to your next item. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of the um, proposed liquefaction, liquefaction assessment policy, um, there is a lot of discussion in the document. It's a good starting point, but I do think that there is need for sufficient improvement because on page um, 70, for example, it talks about the intent of changes to ensure that applications, these are, I guess, um, provided to council for building, uh, that there is sufficient information for council to be able to be satisfied on reasonable grounds that sites are suitable for future building or that structural requirements at building consent stage adequately address site-specific geotechnical uh, conditions. My concern is the use of the word reasonable because under the Resource Management Act, the interpretation of the word reasonable is incomplete. And that definition has been proven in a number of environmental court cases. So it's a caveat to council to make sure that appropriate wording is used in the process going forward in terms of um, determining how liquidation, liquefaction is going to be 
reviewed and the consent processing um, policy or approach adopted by council. So those comments will be noted. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Thank you. Um, I think, to the definition of risk is not adequately covered in that. There's a generic statement on page um, 72 um, that talks about um, larger developments uh, with a higher risk of density of housing. They have an increased risk over smaller scale. I would have thought that the uh, definition of risk is the same no matter what the size of development. So that's a caveat for that too. Um, I guess it's rather important to get this policy right, given that a large part of Oxton Beach, for example, is uh, subject and prone to liquefaction. Um, I have made reference to the third item, that third item, the 7.6 three waters reform, was not allowed from Jaffa Orange to go ahead green for the in respect of the Foxton uh, Aquatic Centre. Thank you. Any questions? Appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate the questions. Thank you. Good. Welcome. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm pleased this, this, this uh, agenda we have today is a really big one. It's provincial, it seems to have a heck of a lot in it. So um, I forgive our people for, you know, having to cross over a bit. I am particularly interested in the liquefaction one and the fact the big range of things and reasonable things that you guys as councillors have to consider. So I'm bringing up a few of my own, okay? The flooding, the stormwater, the urban runoff, which is different from um, stormwater because of the fact that um, growth and development brings more concrete, more runoff, less absorption into the groundwater. Huh? Sorry, but we just, you're getting mixed up with stormwater and liquefaction. Okay, yeah, no, I'm just running into it because hydrology point of water is this Sorry. reference to. Uh, Item 7.4 on the agenda, or are we talking about something else I'd like to be able to keep up? Um, I took my um, liquefaction one off. 7.4, so you're talking to report 7.4. Yes, yes. Hydrology, which is the water, the aquifers and the springs underneath it, okay? Because most of, from the area from Tihora in the south up to Himitani in the north, is a wet bowl, a wetlands bowl. Uh, moving up to the Tararua's where the fault lines lie. Now, the fault lines, uh, the Kaikoura fault line, um, I know it runs on the south, uh, the Hokio side of the lake because my water ball collapsed in 2016 and the uh, Earthquake Commission had to pay me out almost 15000 to get a reboard done because of the sand, right? The fact that a lot of the people in the council don't understand the fault lines that run up on the our side of the beach is a problem. The fact that we are now hearing more and more about the um, the consents that are the growth and developments that are, are a problem in our area out at the beach because of the pressure on the groundwater springs and the aquifers. The time has come for um, the the council to bring this up off the table again the climate change thing, because in reality we need to work on these remedies and backup plans for the affected communities. We need options in place before the tornadoes and the flooding take place. Um, has got a picture here of Hokio flooding and how high it went to. For three weeks we had that. 
We couldn't get a bus in for our people to get medication or fresh food because there wasn't any money in the, in the kitty, which we think is wrong. It was a real shock to us. Right, moving on to page um, the seven, uh, 170, 69, where the, um, the three waters uh, distribution of money comes up. I must admit, if we don't speak to these things on the agenda, we never get another chance to them, and that is where I think Fred and the rest of them are coming from. The fact that all of this money is now coming up. I would like to, um, the Lake Development Plan, a Haiti Grand, um, could we have a little bit more uh, feedback off that? The Levin Town Centre, 2 million. The Community Hub, 500,000. Um, uh, and I see when it comes, this is just round one, right? That's what uh, Taraj one means, yes. But when on, on iwi considerations, we're talking about round two. Where are their figures, please? Any, any questions? So um, there is further opportunity to those in exploratory meeting around the priorities around the tranche fund funding, and that's coming up further in the agenda. We'll talk about those projects uh, then. Are we still allowed to be here? Tran yes, it's an open uh, okay. forum. Um, the tranche one money projects need to be into government before the end of December, and that's why we are developing those uh, projects at the moment. Tranche 2 won't be, uh, won't be considered until 2024, basically. Uh, so at the moment, we've been allocated $4.99 million for Tranche 1. The rest of the funding will follow after the entities have been created. So we're not discussing Tranche 2 at all. But part of the criteria for Tranche 2 is that we consult with Iwi around those projects. I know, because, you know, when you, when you guys did your Dragon's Den talk the other day, none of us really knew all these figures then. No, oh, so after today and following uh, today's meeting, there will be further work done on those projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so let's uh, move to our reports, uh, starting with uh, 7.1, which is the Gladstone Road realignment. Um, can I welcome James to the table, and while he is coming, can I just uh, move 3.1, 3.2, report be received. Sorry, page 19. Can I have a mover and a second? Sorry, Deputy Mason, seconded Councillor K. Simmons. All those in favour? Against, carried. Welcome, James. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, I have to start uh, by issuing a correction on page 23, section 6.3. Uh, the third paragraph currently reads, option two will have some community impacts. It should read, option three will have some community impacts. Okay. So the purpose of the report is to update council on the forecasted cost to complete the Gladstone Road realignment project and seeks a decision on increasing the project's budget to allow for the increased cost. The report also provides commentary on alternative options with reductions in scope to be more in line with the original LTP budget. The recommended option is to complete the project without reducing the project's scope, resulting in an increased cost of $1.26 million bringing the total project cost to $6.26 million. The increases in cost have primarily been caused by a number of risks which have impacted the project at a scale which was not foreseen when the estimate was originally developed. 
The project is now a few months away from reaching completion, but it's not been without its challenges. The team has put a huge effort into bringing the project to where it is. We're very close to fixing a problem that has impacted the Gladstone Road community and also impacted our own operational expenditure since February 2017. It is unfortunate that the project requires additional funding to be completed. However, this extra cost will still be a sound investment as it will reduce the direct maintenance cost to council as well as reduce the financial and well-being impacts to the Gladstone Road community. I would uh, like to address a couple of questions we received to councillors from councillors prior to this meeting. Uh, the first of which was regarding the timeliness of this information being made available to councillors. So I acknowledge that the risk of cost increases should have been signalled to councillors earlier. We are reviewing our project management and reporting processes to ensure that project risks that could have a financial implication are made available and um, signaled to councillors earlier than they have been with this project. Uh, the second question I'd like to address is regarding the lack of provision for walking and cycling within the project. So a dedicated walking and cycling facility has not been included in the design. The project's scope has been focused on delivering resilient access to the Gladstone Road community, and we don't recommend including a dedicated walking and cycling facility to the project's scope at this time. However, investigation into the feasibility and benefits of a walking and cycling improvements program throughout the length of Gladstone Road could be completed and uh, should be completed prior to any significant investment, then a program of work could be prioritised against other walking and cycling improvements throughout the district. I'm uh, happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, James. Um, can I just remind councillors, they would have seen a response from the team earlier regarding some costings that were included in that report, but I cannot, they are sensitive information and um, should not be publicly disclosed, please. Um, that doesn't mean to say that you can't ask general questions around costings, but there were some um, there was some sensitive information contained in that. So, um, does anyone have any questions for James or Daniel? Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Ms Mayor. Um, James, I guess the one thing that probably um, concerns me the most about reading from, from this paper is the, um, under 6.1 and the cost, where it sort of talks about in the event that NCTA rejects our application and we opt for option one, we would draw the 1.26 million from relevant land transport activities across the next two financial years. So basically that means that um, we're taking from other pots and potentially there are less roading projects that will be delivered in other parts of the district. And so I guess I wanted to get your response around um, the, I, I guess, the impact of that on our Ford's work program in terms of that roading space, because we've obviously got an agenda tonight that has uh, lots of dollar amounts for what I would term nice to have projects, yet here we've got, you know, we, you're basically signalling in this report that we are going to be um, potentially short on what I believe is our core business in terms of roading. So are you able to talk to that in terms of project impact? Uh, yes, so I suppose um, perhaps it hasn't been made entirely clear in the report, but our forecasted improvement and um, rehabilitation programs, um, what I generally refer to as our business as usual CapEx programs for roading, um, the cost reductions we're uh, signalling in this report are in line with what our forecast work program is over the next two years anyway. We've had quite a... Um, a lot of uh, factors which have delayed the work program over the 21-22 financial year, and um, it's probably unreasonable to expect that we will be able to catch up the lost work from last year over the next two financial years. So over the course of the LTP, I think regardless which option is selected for Gladstone Road, those reduction in the, um, in the CapEx program would, would see that anyway due to workload. 
Thank you, James. Just one final question, if that's okay. Certainly. Thank you, Richard. Um, so it's just trying to reconcile two parts of the report, um, which is around, sorry, the, under option one on page 22, there's reference to the contingency sum. And so it talks about uh, risks of, for future extreme weather, COVID road costs, time delays, or other unforeseen project risks. One of the things that was, um, and then so I'm trying to reconcile that comment then with 6.3 and also uh, 10. So that's um, consenting issues and also uh, EWI um, considerations. And so on the consenting component, well, basically this is a retrospective consent. And so one of the challenges with that is that we don't have a fixed set of uh, conditions that we're having to work to. So, so there's potentially some surprises at the, at the end of the project if there's rework or other things that are needed. Um, and then in the EWI consideration space, there's reference to um, uh, in considering environmental mitigation and improvement opportunities within the site extents. And so from what I see, both of those things aren't necessarily specifically budgeted for in terms of the increased amount that, that you're seeking nor does it seem to be factored in terms of the contingency amount. So are you able to just speak to how we're going to manage potential costs around both of those things? Uh, yes, I'm happy to speak on that. So um, we do have a fairly idea of a cost envelope that those two risk factors would, um, would present to the project, and we did Account, we did account for those within the uh, contingency value. So the 110,000 um, additional contingency costs, a, a part of that is targeted towards being able to cover um, perhaps additional uh, mitigated planting work or, um, or additional um, environmental mitigation. So can I just clarify then? Um, just on that, so that, yeah, so under 10, the improvement opportunities within the site extents is, is what your, the interpretation of that then is, is around, you're talking about mitigation type plantings, those kind of environmental things, not anything bigger in terms of scope or, um, you know, like other, other, other projects that might sit within the road alignment. Yes, that, that's correct, and we've, um, we've walked over the site and have identified several areas where we believe that might be um, the case that we'll be looking at uh, identifying mitigative uh, wetland creation or planting, and we have a fairly, uh, fairly controlled idea of the scale of those works, so we're pretty comfortable that it can be delivered within the contingency value. Thank you so much. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, James. I'm just confirming for the general public who may not have read the whole order paper that um, we're asking for an additional 1.26 million, which sounds like a heck of a lot, but actually because this is NZTA subsidised at probably about 61%, in reality we're looking at about half a million. So you, you look at the 1.26 and you have a heart attack, um, we, we don't have to come up with a whole lot ourselves. Just confirming that? Yes, so we put the funding application into Waka Kotahi for the cost increase as well. Um, that hasn't been confirmed um, by now. Uh, we, we're expecting a decision this month. Um, but yes, otherwise the total cost impact to council would be 61% of the 1.26 million. Council Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A couple of questions. You mentioned uh, that we may have been able to have the information earlier around the cost escalation. When or how much earlier do you think we could have been across that information? It's, it's hard for me to put an exact date. Um, in terms of a confirmed figure, it would have been um, mid-June, um, where we would have had a really strong idea. Um, we would have been able to signal, and we should have been able to signal the, uh, the cost of uh, the risk, the risk of the cost increases um, 
I would say midway through midway through sort of April, I, I'd say we, we should have been at that point being able to explain that there were risks at that point. Thank you. Um, I have some concerns uh, because that NGTA funding is not, and as you're saying, 6.1 is not a given. Um, and there is another project out there around the disposal of the land which is not required for the corridor. And is that going to be treat, treated as another project as far as the subdivision and the, and the formation of all those additional lots and driveways that need to go in? That will be another project. from James today is that to close this project out moving forward, acknowledging um, there could have been earlier signals around the risk of cost increases, but there's value in acting now to close out the project, given that um, we've got crews established, there's going to be increased maintenance costs, so certainly um, that signal from officers around finishing the job we've started, um, acknowledging that there is a, there is a subsequent project um, which could have some costs coming back or revenue back the other way from disposal of, of that surplus land. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, as we always do around this table, fit the desires into, a, into the available funds. And we know that if we push ahead and complete that road to what we want it to be, and as in the original, something falls out the other end. Something doesn't get done. And I think... Uh, where Councillor Denny's was almost getting to. And, I'm, and in my mind, I'm thinking, we know very soon there is going to be a disposal project come up to get rid of the, that land, and there's going to be a roading component to that. And I would have thought that to be able to couple that with the formation of all those driveways and the new sections up there, it gets pretty close to the to the return on that money for, this, for the sale price of that, so it's almost sort of, self-funding within a very short window, rather than actually dropping $1.26 million potentially of other projects off the already agreed CapEx budgets. And I just feel that because we haven't got all the information, we don't know what NZT, because my decision will be different if I don't know what NZTA's decision is, or if I do know what it is. But that's, that's material. That's, that's significant. And I'm a bit uneasy to support this without that information, knowing that there is another option where the road can be formed, that the bridges are the most important thing. There's no more risk of washouts. We've got an all-weather access through there. But in, in time, when the, the further thinking goes on about what happens to that land either side, there is another conversation to be had. Um, Council Bishop, we're in a situation where we don't have the advice for you today. Um, and uh, certainly in terms of us providing additional guidance around um, your future subdivision, again, we're not in a position to provide that advice today either. Um, it's not something that we are that we're poised to provide good advice on. Um, I, I think what I just want to emphasise, and I thought Mr Wallace um, described it well, is that you know, I, I hear the concern that by approving this funding, it means that something else miss, misses out in our community, that our Land Transport, Transport Asset Management Plan will say is important. But if you look at what our Land Transport team has spent their time and energy on in the last eight weeks, we're already behind this financial year alone. And so the, the idea that we're going to be able to do this project, and in addition to that, the $1.2 million of work that has missed out, or will miss out, I think what you've heard from Mr Wallace is um, we've been really up front early on in saying actually the capacity of the, the organisation but also our contractors to deliver on that, um, as well as the catch-up work from the last two financial years of the land transport activity, we're not in a position to give you confidence on that. And just to be clear, James, the target completion if this for this project is... Uh, December, we're 
we are, the program is having the project completed in December. Um, I, I would just like to um, add a, a bit of context. Um, so the value we are um, asking for in the report, it's based on a um, negotiated sum with the contract with the contractor, and the contractor cannot hold this price indefinitely. So we are seeking a decision today, and um, if the choice is made to go for one of the other options and we want to look at um, pushing the decision to upgrade it later, we'll not be able to hold the same value. Councillor yeah. Tupapur. Just um, listening to um, the elected members' um, co comments or um, questions so far, and I guess um, my understanding, like reading this, with, with regards to whether we get that extra subsidy from NZTA or not, um, it's almost like we're more likely to if we choose option one, because on page 25 it's, there's a risk that NZTA you know, will require a portion of that subsidy to be repaid if we work with two or three, and um, we won't meet their specifications um, as per the original business case, unless it's option one. And we've not even tested that um, opinion with them at this stage, so I kind of feel like we've got to, even though you acknowledge that, yeah, in the scheme of things, we do think about you know, money for Foxton Pools or Whited Air Surf Club um, because we're having to consider the big picture and, and where money goes. But um, it's almost like if we want that 61%, we've got to choose option one. And further delays means cost is not guaranteed, you know, it just continues to increase. So um, am I reading that right yet? That's, that would be... Most certainly the very best decision for now. Yeah, that's that's certainly um, that's certainly my recommendation and the team's recommendation, yes. Thank you, James. Thank you, Dean. So we had recommendation 3.3 that council adopt option one, complete Gleason Road realignment project without reducing the project scope. You're looking rather quizzical. Yeah, can I can I just, just a point of clarification um, to the chief executive. Based on the comments from Councillor Bishop about the subdivision and the, and the future outside of the road and alignment opportunities and costs. So those are outside of the scope of this project as it's currently defined. Do you have any advice for us around a potential resolution that could be made here that um, talks about, or talks to the, I guess, the offsetting that Councillor Bishop is, is raising? Because I certainly have some personal appetite to that. Um, and, I don't, um, and, and I don't, if the table felt that way, I think that this would be an appropriate time to have a resolution that, that kind of picked up that sentiment. Um, through you, Councillor Jennings, uh, look, as Councillor Bishop had spoken to that, in my mind, I was thinking of a solution around where we might ring fence the debt, and therefore if we were to progress a project around subdivision, any money made off that could, um, could fund this. I think what is a little bit tricky and hence because it's not been a piece of advice we've asked, been asked for until tonight, we need to provide you some advice around how that aligns with um, the, our funding agreement with Waka Kotahi um, because if we start a project that then makes us money to, to fund our contribution, that yeah, it makes it a little bit tricky. Oh, on that basis, happy to, happy to pull back on that. Okay, so... Um, I need a mover and a seconder for the resolution. Councillor Mitchell uh, moving. Councillor Jennings is seconding. Is there any further discussion or debate? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you.
And so just finishing off with 3.4, the Council provides delegation to the Chief Executive to conclude negotiations to award the final contract separable portion. Can, doesn't quite read and write to me, sorry, Jason. Um, to complete the project. Can't move Councillor Jennings, um, seconded Councillor Brannigan. Um, any further discussion? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. 1 down, 10 to go. Pardon? Um, can we move to uh, 7.2 Fox and Pool, uh, consideration of options? The purpose of uh, the report is to present options for consideration on the proposed redevelopment of Fox and Pool's set direction as to the way forward with this project. Can I move uh, 3.1 and 3.2 uh, that the Foxton Pool report be received? That this matter is recognised as significant in terms of Section 76 of the Local Government Act, noting that the Foxton Pool is a strategic asset as part of Council's significance and engagement policy. Mover in a second of police, Councillor Allen, Councillor Brannigan, all those in favour? Thank you. Against? Carried? Welcome, Brent. Thank you, Your Worship, and um, good afternoon, uh, councillors, uh, community board members, public and staff. Um, the purpose of today's paper is to seek direction on the way forward for um, the Fox and Pool project. As you're aware, through previous meetings, briefings and workshops, the cost of construction is significantly higher than what's been allocated through the LTP um, and what the initial indication was. Um, <clears throat> in introducing the report this afternoon, um, and as noted um, within the report itself, um, we received the indication of cost to build in April uh, 2022, um, and there's likely been escalation between now and that point. Um, to try and mitigate this, we've increased the contingency by $100,000 um, to the um, total budget for the option one being 5.8. Um, there is some risk, I guess that's not enough, and if 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 it's not, then it's going to place more pressure on the budget overall. Um, this afternoon, there's six options under consideration um, as a result of the workshop that was conducted in June. Um, I'm looking forward to the way forward and, and implementing um, whatever option Council chooses to go forward. And I'll pass over to any questions. Any questions for Mr Harvey? Yes, Thank you, Brent. Um, just a question around the relocation of the mechanical plant. Um, that's a $300,000 price tag. Could you talk to the consequences of not including that in the package at that cost? Certainly. Um, through you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, currently, the, under option one, uh, the proposal... Um, for the mechanical plant is to be relocated, is relocating it, to, well, sorry, locating it on the roof of the of the Fox and Pool. Um, one of the options to um, bring the cost down is relocating that to. Uh, there's a couple of op options presented um, on the ground of the building, either out the front or out the back. Um, and moving it out the back would be the would be the preferred of those two. It would reduce the cost by approximately $300,000 by not having to build a separate platform for the ventilation. Um, it would still allow for future proofing by, um, by the way it's located. Um, the primary reason it was on the roof rather than where it is now is the location of all the other services. So by moving it to the back of the building, it's running extra pipes and, um, and to, the, to the plant room to, to the, um, and then out into the facility. Um, on the ground, uh, sorry, on the ground it is probably more open and it would be in a cage, it wouldn't be in a, in a standalone uh, building itself, uh, whereas on the roof it's out of the way and out of, out of sight, essentially. But it is a valid option to move that part and reduce the, the cost by approximately $300,000. Thank you. Um, second question, and I'm sorry, I hope this isn't catching on the, on the hop, but during a, a previous workshop or briefing, when we talked about the usage, sort of the peak usage of the pool 
compared with the Horofeno Aquatic Centre, how did the two compare on a per capita basis? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Allen. Um, in terms of the usage at Horofe uh, sorry, Levin Aquatic Centre, um, if we're looking at the same 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 period from September through to April, the same period um, as Fox and Paul operates, um, Levin Aquatic Centre was sort of had a hundred uh, an average of three hundred and forty one people through the facility per day. Um, in terms of Fox and for that same period, um, it's approximately eighty nine people per per day. Um, I'm not, I don't have a, on hand right now the per capita per head of population. Um, Available right for me now, but yeah. Okay, but I think we can do the sums in terms of population 21,000 versus six or whatever. Um, referring to page 43 of the agenda, uh, number 13, <coughs> July 22 assessment, it did note there that uh, no significant deterioration has occurred since 2019, 2020, 2020. 21, though all those condition assessments that no significant deterioration has occurred. Therefore, just to be preemptive here, I guess the question that could be asked is why should we do anything in the meantime? Yeah, so the, there's a few um, ways I can answer that. And while there's been no significant de deterioration in the moisture readings that the structural assessment assesses on each year, um, there has still been some um, some deterioration, um, and as we continue to operate the pool in the current environment, it will continue to, to deteriorate in some way, shape, or form. It's not getting better, um, although a couple of the reading, a couple of isolated readings were, were better. I think it can be put down to um, a number of factors. One is when we do the actual assessment, um, the structural assessment each year. So it has varied from year to year. So 2019, it was right on the back end of the season when potentially the moisture content in the air is a lot higher and in the beams, um, whereas the last two years have been in July where the pool hasn't been operating for a, a couple of months. Um, in terms of the report, um, in terms of the, sorry, the structural assessment, it, we will see signal, a continued maintenance um, increases over the years if we continue to run it as we currently do um, without, without making significant change. Um, and in the proposal currently, there's the ability to reuse the primary components of the structure. So if we continue to run the pool for, another period, for a period of time to a point where we can't run it safely anymore, Potentially, we won't be able to use some of that existing structure, so it will add to costs. The other um, part of the um, environment in the pool hall that I think it's worth mentioning is that in summer it can get very, very hot in there. Um, so we're talking temperatures upwards of 35 degrees. So from a customer and a staff perspective, it's not, it's not a comfortable environment. Um, and in saying that as well, we do know that throughout the year there's condensation that drips from the roof. So um, from a customer experience coming in, they get their equipment or their, their bags stripped on, the seats can be wet, and that's variable based on the outside conditions. So it can be quite bad, and some days it can be not as bad. We do try and mitigate it throughout the season. We're opening the doors, um, but it's still there regardless of what we're trying to do. Councillor Bush. Thank you. Brent, I just want to focus on Aquatics district wide, and there's been a lot of commentary tonight to support all those different aspects of what the aquatic facilities offer our community. There's no question they're all valid. There has also been mention of the strain of of capability to to service the amount of people that are wanting to use those services, and they are getting towards that end of being, as you've said yourself, um, tight. We are growing at 2% per annum compounding and there is no question that fast forward 20 years that we're going to have a significantly larger population here and we will all remember that the major aquatic redevelopment in the district 
is mm-hmm. actually being pushed right out. Therefore, all of that growth that we talk about, that we have planned for, that we know is coming, we cannot pretend to service that by a current facility in Levin and building a new building on top of the one in Foxton. And because of the financial constraints that were clear and present at the last LTP round, the only option at that point was to dump a somewhat large $60 million redevelopment of the cottage in the, in the region or the district out of the plan. So what could we expect if we are asked to provide this extra money to supply some security of service for that community in Foxton for an extended season, when are we back at the table for another 10, 15 million in between the total redevelopment? How many more redevelopments are we going to have of our existing facilities before we say, hey, let's just be real about this, we need to do something which is going to be somewhat future-proof, because rather than doing the Band-Aid, what does it look like? And I don't think we're in that headspace yet, but in every other conversation we have, we give effect to the growth that's coming. And, and I just, I am, have we got a, a, an eye towards the future of how you're going to provide that space in the interim, in, in, within the next 20 years? Because, like I say, the major redevelopment's been dumped out because of finances, all that um, pressures we have on debt, on ceilings. When, does, when do we come back for this next conversation? Um, thank you, Councillor Bishop. So in terms of, um, I guess, of in terms of Levin Aquatic Centre, um, in the next, in year three of the LTP, it, it does take that concept of the hub and the bigger, um, I guess, the bigger aquatic development um, and looks to formulate a business case to support or not support that. So that would be taken with a lens or with a lens of the future. Now, in terms of how that looks, in terms of LTP, um, it could be staged over a number of different years. So the aquatic, aquatic part may be first before we look to integrate with other spawning components on the site. Um, so that I just the point I guess I'm trying to make is there is provision at this point um, for the for the for that piece of work. The the full development of um, Live in Aquatic Centre, you're correct, wasn't, isn't in the um, LTP at all at this point. There is some figures being put in there uh, for strate- strategic and growth related pro- uh, projects in, from year six onwards, but uh, there is a further conversation to have around Live in Aquatic Centre and how that services our district. Um, <clears> Through <throat> you, Worship, I think it's acknowledged, worth acknowledging that the aquatic strategy did have a like a vision to have that eye for the future and acknowledging that obviously the the aquatic strategy, as I understand, was never formally adopted by council. Uh, And so I think that, you know, regardless of the decision by council today, um, our our long-term plan amendment for all the right reasons in the coming year is going to have a really deliberate focus around three waters. But we need to, as quickly, sharpen our mind to, as we look to three waters reform, how we can ensure that our 2024 long-term plan is set up to ensure that we are thinking about, well, what are the things that within this long-term plan weren't able to be thought about when we think about the impact of growth on this community? Councillor Jennings. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks for that commentary, and I'm really pleased that um, Councillor Bishop raised the, that particular dialogue because that, that certainly was on my list of things to, to raise. And I guess um, I'm at the point of the question around option three that's on the um, order paper. And what I'd like is some advice around in doing that, um, it, which is the reconsult, con, reconsultation option, does that enable us to put additional options into the mix. For example, asking the question, you know, um, or, or putting in options around an expanded Levin Aquatic Centre or an entirely new Greenfields district-wide aquatic centre hub, whatever you want to call it. Do we have the opportunity to have a wide range of options that are 
about destruct solutions, not necessarily just box and focus solutions. Um, through you, Worship, look, that is an option available to council, but um, you know, council ultimately very soon as they start to get into the long term plan amendment workshops are going to have to make some decisions about what are their priorities going into this long term plan amendment uh, because the organisation does not have the capacity to carry you know, the seven big, um, big transformational moves. They actually only have the capacity to drive three or four transformational moves. And so I think there's a number of decisions that can't still, still have to make the rest of this term. Um, you know, referencing the landfill decision, uh, referencing where we might land around three waters asset management. And so, yes, it's a possibility, but council can't do everything in this amendment, amended LTP uh, without saying no to some other things. Thank you, Mayor uh, Mason. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Mr Harvey. Um, and thank you for the report. I just want to uh, tease out that, that growth um, assumption that we've made and when, and just uh, probably for the, the benefit of people listening and submitters when we had this discussion during the long term plan about the pool we talked about a future proof design that that was modular of type that's that's still the case with what's proposed here, that's my first question uh, thank you, Deputy Mason. Yes, it is. So regardless of the option, of, of the two options, there would be the ability to future-proof and add on at, at different points. So yes, correct. And adding on, allowing for that growth that we're talking about around 2%, that would see our Fox and Fox and Beach community look like about somewhere between ten and 15,000 people. That would, would that modular type pool, would you see that as being adequate for that population growth that we're expecting? Uh, yes, I would. And through the um, aquatic strategy, it identified the gaps in provision across the whole district, um, and leisure is our, our biggest gap right now. Um, so the future, for, if we're looking at Fox and Paul in terms of the next steps, it is directly addressing the leisure components for, for the community. Um, so, so yes, I do think um, with, the, with the current proposal, it would factor in for that. For that. Um, and I did ask this question earlier, but just for the benefit of uh, people listening, the proposal was 2.6 million that was consulted on and agreed to in the long term plan. But you've come back with a revised proposal that adds 2.8 million dollars, um, so a total of significantly higher than what we went out on. But if that were to be approved in some way or shape with funding from whatever source, what would be the life expectancy or the realistic life expectancy of that facility, given that we've been roundly criticised as a council for, for previous decisions that haven't uh, provided a sound building? Uh, the life expectancy would be um, 50 years plus. Brent, thank you. Um, yes, Brent. So, sorry. <laughs> oh, are you keen? You are keen. No, you keen? <laughs> I've got your head. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Brent. Listen, my question is around um, the use of the Fox and Pool, um, not just for the Fox and community, but for the wider community. And I'll talk about Shannon, who uh, has a school pool. Uh, it's very cold, obviously. It's unheated. It's very small. Uh, it's used for a couple of, you know, during the nice summer, four summer weeks. That we get. Um, and then, uh, as I understand it, about 11 visits from the Shannon School to the Fox and Aquatic Centre this year. If the Fox, Fox and Aquatic Centre wasn't there through that period that the Shannon use it, would Shannon School have access to the, uh, the, the, the Living Aqu Aquatic Centre? Um, with the same flexibility, they were able to access at Fox and uh, thank you, Councillor Brennan. They would have access to live in aquatic centre. Uh, the challenge would be when we could accommodate a booking because of the, the extra demand at, at that site and basically working around existing bookings and, and programs. So it would potentially not be as flexible as we are with Foxton. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Brent. Um, 
in regards to the 89 people you mentioned going through every day, so when you think about all the extracurricular activities happening here, including the Learn to Swim, that I believe is getting quite popular, are those numbers separate, or have you actually put them into that average? Uh, no, those numbers are, the Learn to Swim numbers are included, so it's based on the door count through the door, so anybody coming in. Okay. I guess my question, Brent, is about the escalation and, and cost. So to go basically double in cost in a couple of years, you know, has housing doubled in cost to build in, in a couple of years? It just seems over the top to me. Um, and just clarifying, you've had one tender or one price? Is that, is that right? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm just wondering if we if we put it out there, like, is it possible to get a firm who knows what they're doing with swimming pools to to do the design, and then have a company follow that design so we get a decent foolproof design? And I'm just wondering if we could be able to get it done at a more realistic price as long as they had a decent design to follow, because I certainly wouldn't want to cut corners and be in the same problem that we are in now, but it just seems crazy to, to spend 5.8 million putting a building over the top of a pool that's already there. To me, it seems seems ridiculous. And um, would it be a good idea to get some prices from some other people if we had a foolproof design? Uh, thank you, Councillor Mitchell, and that, that's a good question. Um, so, on the um, we we have a designer that has worked up uh, the pre preliminary designs. So, in terms of the construction of the facility, it's been priced off that um, off off the design that we have. Um, the other point I'll make with the costs um, that we've received is we. We, did, we made an approach to a construction firm that is doing a lot of work within aquatic facilities. They're working within the market, and they gave us the price of $5.7 million. Um, at that point, we I brought this straight to council, and we had a conversation around it, and I, the direction from that point was to test the price a bit, in a bit more detail. So I actually engaged with the uh, QS who provided the initial um cost estimate of 2.6 in December 2020 when we went through the LTP. Um, the difference within the two QSs that have come back is within $100,000. Um, so it's not it's not significantly different, and it's based off the, the, the scoping document that our design team have completed. Um, so, yeah, we could go out and, and to do to the market um, and, and test the price even further, but we've had an independent assessment already and, and it's on the same scope of what we're, what we're looking to build. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And so Councillor Mitchell, what you'll see is, um, you know, re-tendering the work in an open and competitive tender process is an option that we're suggesting that council might want to consider, um, but the advice we're wanting to give you is that the current price that we've got has been independently tested, and the risk is by us closing that procurement process, which, you know, acknowledging that was an internal decision that was made to go direct to market, by closing that process, we run the risk of that company not tendering for the work, um, we lose that price, because we've said goodbye to that price. Um, and, you know, we might be in a position where we get people tender for that work, um, but certainly the advice Mr Harvey is giving to the table is we don't want to find ourselves in a position we find ourselves in now, which is where we're not engaging a specialist firm who understand how we build pools that last. And sorry through you, Worship, if I can just make uh, another comment around uh, the price that we received in um, December 2020 and the difference between now, the, the additional component regarding the reception and the spa pool wasn't factored into the 2020 cost, and it is now, so that is, um, and, and also the mechanical ventilation um, on the roof, that, that wasn't part of that initial Councillor yeah. Tupper. 
I'm um, not sh- I've never done this before, so I'm asking if it can be. And that is, I'd like to ask a question of the Kira Kira Ward councillors. Is no, that, it just it's their community. They would know the vibe more than me, and I. I'll allow that. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so obviously, there's the resolution around um, funding the short form. And that's X millions. My question for you is around the operational um, cost going forward. If we approve the, um, that tonight, um, the project in its full or reduced scope, um, and the modelling suggests that, um, well, obviously the extra hours, the pools open, staff, rah rah rah. On page thirty-eight, you read there that. Um, at best, the revenue would be 114,000. Um, expense would now go from 274,000 to 536,000 um, per annum to run it, and so there's a loss of 421. Um, and by month, that works out to be about 30,000, 35,000 dollars a month. Would do you think um, a, a targeted rate for the, the area of some sort, I'm not suggesting the full amount, um, to to capture some of that, because if we were to do the, the full version, and um, can people, would that, is there an appetite for that, or no, just for the district should just fully pick up the tab? Happy to answer it, I think it's a pretty clear question from me is um, no, uh, for, for, for lots of reasons, and, uh, and I'll outlay why in my subsequent commentary in that the debate. Uh, I think a better approach would be, in my view, um, the cost of usage of the pool, so the entry to the pool, brought up on par with what's paid in Levin, uh, given the money that's been, going to be spent on upgrading the pool. And I think that would be a reasonable a reasonable approach, and I think that would be... Um, that would be Reasonably well received by the community, acknowledging um, the money that's just been spent on the on upgrading the pool. Um, so, that answer the proof. Yes, brief, brief brief answer is no, for a slightly different reason, which is a discussion around targeted rates and where they should sit is a separate discussion, and it's inappropriate. I, I feel to introduce it as part of a debate on a specific issue. So I think I think Councillor took for the question. She was only seeking her views. We went down. Um, in, in light of these questions, though, in the report, Brent, do we have an idea of um, loss or gain on what the Levin Aquatic Centre does? Do we have any sense of what that is compared to what Foxton is? Uh, I, I'd have to go back and, and do a bit of work. Yeah, the, the, look, the true cost of a swim in, in a pool is probably... Um, $20 per person between 17 and 20 years as an estimate, um, regardless of, and that, that's nationwide, it's not just, yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, so, have we any further questions? Here's not. Thank you, Brent. And look, um, I know this uh, topic has occupied your mind for some time. I appreciate the amount of uh, work that has gone into uh, all the briefings, workshops and reports that you've given to us. Thank you. So, uh, moving back to um, our recommendations on page number 26, 28, sorry. Councillor Allen. Just to be here, I'd like to move uh, 3.3, option one. Do I have a second for that? Can- Councillor Kitt, who put his hand up first. Thank you. Okay, so option one is on the table. Um, Councillor Allen, do you want to speak first? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Look, um, it's, there's been some reference to option three by, I think, Councillor Jennings, uh, and perhaps others, uh, which is about reconsulting on the additional cost. Uh, just briefly speaking to that and why I prefer option one, I just want to note that option three 
to me feels odd because really tonight is about debating whether or not we believe Foxton should have a pool. The additional costs issue is one that we, we should capture in the debate itself because we've been through the LTP process. There was overwhelming support for the Rolls-Royce option versus what is now sitting as option one. There was overwhelming support among submitters for Foxton to have a pool that was fit for purpose. So to go back to the community now and say, look, here's the extra cost now, what do you think? I have to ask the question, what, when have we done that over recent years on other issues? Let's be governors, let's make a decision based on the reality of what's happening in the world and in New Zealand at the moment, which is hugely escalating costs. We've seen that happen, we dealt with it earlier tonight, and we'll deal with it again. Extra costs are a reality, and they need to form part of the debate when we make decisions, rather than tripping back to the community when it happens, because we'll have very little time to do anything else if we do it every time we address the, the uh, crippling increase in costs. So, Mr Mayor, I just need to emphasise the point that the Foxton pool was built by council. It is a council pool, and it turned out to be a dog's breakfast. Council has to own that fact, and council, I believe, has a moral imperative to put it right. There is a mandate for us to put it right, and, and we know the facts, but let's put it on the record for the public that during the LTP process, there were 372 submissions on the pool. That was the issue of the moment under the LTP. That was the big issue of the moment. The public bought into that discussion, and 79% of the public supported the, the Rolls-Royce option or the second option, which is pretty much what sits on the table today. It's important to note that, of course, the vast majority of submitters came from Foxton. You would expect nothing less than that. They were directly affected by it. But interestingly, support also came from Levin, from Shannon, from Waitariri, from Oho, and from Manico. And the majority of those people who submitted also supported option one or two. So I'm saying, Mr Mayor, that there was district-wide support for that pool and for the pool to be, not only for the pool, but for the pool to be done right. It's also important to put the personal face around this. One submitter who noted that the, the pool mattered because it was a safe, cheap, healthy option for young children and for teens during the winter months in our town and in our community. And we need to think about that social good factor. We need to remember and I think particularly of teenagers, who are often the missing people when it comes to delivery of services, that that pool gave, could give them that option if it was available all, all year round. The community wellbeing argument, Mr Mayor, is absolutely important. It's one thing that the Hurufanua District Council can be proud of, is the way we deliver community wellbeing. We think about it, we think about the recent tragedies that have happened in our district and look at how this council have stepped up. We're about much more than roads, rubbish and rates. We're a community-focused council and, we're, and the pool is part of that. The therapy pool, the older people who use it during off-peak times, there's evidence, as the report shows, of increased use of the pool for therapy purposes. The Learn to Swim, which is growing in the use of that pool. It falls off the learn to swim when the pool is closed in winter, of course, but interestingly, those people don't go to live in. The learn to swim stops when the pool stops in the north, north of the river. Mention has been made by Council Brannigan about the, the use by Shannon uh, School of the Pool, the 11 bookings last season, and the consequences, the reality of the consequences should the pool close how would the Horofanu Aquatic Centre cope with those extra numbers? So this is an argument about pragmatism as well as about vision. Option one is about future-proofing. The growth strategy, it's about the 95th percentile which this council is working, the assumption it's working on. We know growth is happening. The only discussion is how fast. And we know that the growth is going to happen north of the river too. We know that. The growth strategy addresses that. The, the, the 
revised district plan and how that will speak to the need for more land up in Foxton speaks to the reality that that area is going to grow. It's important uh, to note just in passing that, that part of this is around financials. Option one, my regret is that the second part of option one talks about the shortfall of the 2.8 million because I believe that the reality is that it will be less than that. Already we've had, heard from, uh, from officers that there, there's, a, there's a potential saving, or probably I believe a real saving, of $300,000 when we look at the mechanical plant. There's one number already that we can talk about reducing. The Foxton Beach free housing, holding account, despite a submission tonight, I've got to say that I want a conversation with that community about this pool and about whether they're prepared to step up. The community board is showing leadership, saying that they believe there's some real opportunities there, and I think that's an, got to be another full source of funding, and I firmly believe that if we take it to that community, they'll show the same willingness that they've shown in the past. So there are real abilities to reduce the cost. To me, Mr Mayor, it's got to be option one. Those three additions, you know, the, the, uh, the mechanical plant's fine, the reception area and the, and the um, spa pool, the spa pool, thank you. We've seen in the report and we understand why those things are important. Um, and, and, and necessary. Um, in terms of the reality of the loan, and look, I get it, I understand that we can't continually be funding everything, but we must also look at, as we look at each of these, we have to look at what the cost of delivering this is. And, I, you know, if we believe in this project, if we believe in the pool, the idea that there will the, the average property price in Levin, the increase will be, for the average property price, $1.72 a year. That'll be the cost of delivering option one. And it will be less, minus the 300000 plus, hopefully, some contribution from the freeholding account. So what are the alternatives to, to um, closing down that pool or walking away from the project? The Horifanur Aquatic Strategy has never been adopted by council. There is no active plan. There is no plan B. There might be, there may well be in the future, but when in the future and what's meant to happen in the meantime uh, to, the, to the needs of the people north of the river. I just want to mention briefly the shuttle service. Please disregard that red herring. Think about the realities of a shuttle service. What will that look like? How will that work? What are the likelihoods of someone from Foxton getting on a shuttle bus, going down for a swim, doing God knows what for the next few hours until the bus arrives again and going back again? The reality is that pool use is, has to be flexible. It's also about downtime, distance, etc., all those deterrents. So the shuttle service simply isn't a go. So... In summary, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I just want to say this. We built the pool, we mucked it up, we've got to put it right. It's our responsibility. The community agreed with us during the long-term plan that it is our responsibility to put it right. The submissions showed that that was the topic of the moment, that was the topic of the day. Growth is real, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen up north. The alternatives are not realistic. An alternative of, of a strategy which doesn't exist, an alternative of a shuttle bus, it simply makes no sense. We cannot walk away from it. Doing nothing is simply not an option. I urge councillors to back the pool, to back Foxton, and actually to back the district in doing so, and let's back the future. Thank you. Councillor Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I um, am really nervous about us tackling this issue um, outside of a long term plan project because for me, uh, we spent a huge amount of time, resource, effort into putting together a long term plan for this district where all wants, wishes, needs, Absolute 
requirements were put on the table. There would have been thousands of work streams that needed to be funded by our community. And this table, not unanimously, but this table decided as to what it would put towards that project. Because why? We were in a really tight spot of affordability. And that hasn't changed. It's only got worse because of escalation across every other work stream that we can think of. So the decision has already been made. The Foxton community came, yes, they did want the Rolls Royce. And there's no question that would have been a great outcome, but this table made a decision, actually, we can't afford that. The community can't afford that. And we keep talking about if we do the irresponsible thing about spending in one spot and not actually understanding what the knock-on effect of that, that's really poor financial governance. What it points to is that we've got to do our long-term plans a whole lot better. They've got to come with proper business cases that we don't get lumbered with this time and again. You talk about learnings. Let's take some learnings off it. I don't want to be a lifelong learner. I want to put some learnings into action. And that's coming up in, a, in another couple of uh, papers. Mrs. Davidson, I don't know how long we're going to be here tonight. I, this, this decision cannot be made in isolation. It has to go back as an option three and reconsult, not just on what option, but when we talk about every need across the whole community. Because if we spend millions millions and millions of dollars where, where we don't uh, take into effect all the wishes of the whole community, as we did in the last LTP, we are picking favourites. We're not doing our job. We're not acting as district-wide councillors. We've only got a set budget, damn it, and it's not a big one. And yes, we have time and again people coming with a wish list a mile long and then always underpinned by, but don't you dare put the rates up more than inflation. And we know we can't make that equation stick, and we end up having to do the compromising. And we do that in one point where we strike the rates uh, at the annual plan or the long-term plan. To relitigate this outside of that process, I'm not part of that. I won't be supporting it, because it's really, really bad financial management. Councillor Jennings. I'll, I'll fall on from Councillor Bishop because it's, it's almost like he was in, sitting inside my body and saying exactly uh, exactly what I wanted to say. And he's covered off absolutely uh, all, all of the points that I wanted to make. Um, and and I guess that the challenge um, that I have uh, for Councillor Allen um, in, in, in his very articulate speech is to, to articulate in your right of reply if we proceed, proceed with this additional spending, what does fall off? What, uh, what, it's either a nice-to-have project that is in the LTP that falls off somewhere else and so some other community uh, suffers, uh, or it's a core infrastructure project. So that is the, our core business. The roads, uh, rubbish and, and, and water, I think you said. You know, it's what falls off. What does the community miss out on? That's the whole point, is that the LTP process... It is a process where we consider everything as a whole and make decisions uh, at, at, that involve trade-offs. So that's my question to you, Councillor Allen, is where's the, where, what, what drops off? Deputy Mayor Mose. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and acknowledging um, Councillor Alan's, as usual, uh, eloquent advocacy for this project. I guess I, I'm frustrated that a decision we made as recently as last year has come back with such an increase in budget. It 
just seems unjustifiable to me. We just dealt with an order paper item that, if it had been a doubling in price, would have been a $10 million road. And I think we would have felt somewhat nervous and anxious about that. And if we had opted for what has been referred to, I think, as the Rolls-Royce decision uh, through the long-term plan project, we could potentially now be facing an $18 million decision, such as my discomfort with this uh, doubling, more than doubling, of price. I am concerned, though, that we have to make the right decision because we do. We have been challenged by the public about previous councils uh, not future-proofing uh, facilities that they've been charged with building. However, I, I, I can't support this doubling in price because we haven't tested this with a business case. We've gone to market to one supplier, yes, a preferred supplier, but we haven't tested it. We haven't seen a business case. Um, we don't know, um, and I accept the Chief Executive has responded to that through question time, but we don't know what the supply chain issues are like now, what availability will be, and that hasn't been tested through a business case model, which I'm very uncomfortable about, because in my questions earlier to officers, um, I asked, did, did this 5.7 million bus, um, proposal now provide absolute confidence in final cost to officers? And I couldn't get uh, a determination that that was, that was the end of it, that there wouldn't be more required. So I am supportive still, as I was through the long-term plan, of those... Um, rehabilitations and improvements being made to the Foxton Pool, but the price of it uh, doesn't sit well with me and I can't support it. What I would support is going back and consulting with the community about use of the Foxton Beach freeholding account and funds that might be available through that to support what is an important project for Foxton and to find out what the appetite of Foxton is for that money to support this important asset, but I can't support uh, this price increase without knowing what else we would have to lose out on as a district in order to have it. Um, looks like there's uh, a void of um, conversation at the moment, Councillor Brennan. I was waiting for everyone to have their say, but that's all right, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, chime in. Okay. Can I first say that, um, thank you, Councillor Allen, for, for outlining uh, the reality around this thing, not some pipe dream of a $60 million spend on an aquatic centre that there's no plan for, vision for, strategy around. It's a pipe dream that popped up in a 20-year LTP process, along with $36 million of spending at Donnelly Park, which again was a pipe dream in 20 years' time, that clouded the whole conversation around this pool, happened then and it's happening again right now. And it's, it's just unbelievable in my view. This is not a blank canvas. This is something, as Councillor Allen articulated, was built by Council. Not any organisation, peripheral organisation, that gave it to Council and said, here, yeah, take this um, and deal with it. Council built it. You create, we created an expectation in a community and an asset in a community that is valued, that is highly used, as you've heard tonight and heard before. And, in that, and it continues, despite the, the lack of um, uh, the challenges with the facility, is highly used and highly valued by the public. And as Councillor Allen outlined, um, the community, the wider community, not just Foxton, but the Shannons and the wider community, supported that build. And yes, there have been cost escalations, and we all know why. To put it now back onto another LTP, I'm not sure how that would work, and I need, would need some guidance from the CE, because we've all been through the LTP, and the LTP, we came up with this, This uh, we, we took the vote on the pool and what we were going to do with the pool, and we ended a contract with our community. 
and there's been some cost escalations, and we're now saying to the community, oh, sorry community, we, we're backing down on that, we, we're going to take that contract away, we're not going to um, honour our contract with you, because there's been cost escalations. That is not the fault of the community. And you've heard tonight the cost of that, of servicing the, the, the figure to go um, through with this project. And you heard from, we heard from Count Mr Harvey, and, and this, all these peripheral things come in to, to cloud it, where it's quite clear that this, um, this costing has been peer reviewed, it's been looked at in many ways. It's come, come back, it's come forward, and the figure is still remains the same. We've heard tonight the, the, challenge, the opportunities of, of subsidy, uh, which we heard on the, on the which we heard absolutely on the road out to um, Makahika. We could easily have said, right, well, sorry, you're going to get a middle road because we don't believe uh, we've we got no guarantees that money's going to be there. But we supported that without a, uh, a contract with our community, apart from a verbal one. We have a contract with our community. We need to honour it. The community have supported it. The community have said they'll pay for this 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 uh, this, uh, this facility. Happy to have it. We think about growth, we talk about growth, growth is not just parts of this district. Growth is happening everywhere, across the district. And I'll, and I'll bring to the council's attention, recently just on the outskirts of Foxton, there's 25 to 20, I think it's 28 hectares of land just sold for development. And we heard the planning team, uh, Lauren Baddock, talk about that recently, um, the easily um, the developable, how easy it is to develop that bit of land, probably the highest, uh, easiest bit of land in the district to develop right now. And that's just been sold for development. 25 odd hectares. How many houses are going to go on that? How many, how many more rating units are going to go on that to help fund this pool? How many people who build houses on that land and hear some exciting things about it are going to use that facility that won't fit into this facility right here? I remind councillors that in the last five, six years, we've spent up to $2 million on the Live In Aquatic Centre and a refit. A refit that was largely cosmetic. In that, we put a hydrotherapy pool. And councillors will remember the passionate plea from Carol Cumming and her team that came in here and said to us the value of that hydrotherapy pool. And we, and we didn't blink. And we did it. I know Councillor Bush, you're shaking your head and you didn't, you didn't like the development then. And that's fine. That's your choice. <laughs> um, but that went ahead. We also were challenged recently 474k for a hydro slide for a new staircase. We didn't really blink. We did it. Because it's a community expectation. It was part of that facility for the community. We had a contract with our community. We were providing that level of service. Yet all of a sudden, magically, at Fo and, and, and for Fox and the wider district, including Shannon, we're saying, sorry, we're not going on that community. We don't value what you already have. In fact, we're going to take it away because we might build some flash thing and live in one day. That's not governance, and that's not appropriate, and it doesn't fit what we're here for, and we're better than that, in my view. I understand all the pressures of finance, absolutely. I understand Councillor Bishop's ongoing passionate plea about how we LTP, about how we do our finance and, and revenue um, plans and strategies, etc. But it's not fair to use the Fox and Pool to further that. That's a different discussion, and we shouldn't be clouding it. It's a contract with our community. Our community have told us what they want. They pay the rates. They're paying for it. And we have, we have a responsibility as governors to implement it. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm kidding. Uh, <coughs> What is the greatest thing on this earth? E tangata, e tangata, e tangata. It's about people, it's about people, it's about people. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> why I, um, I'm supporting uh, this option, <clears throat> one, is because this, our core business is about people. 
the, um, all the other things that we do as governors is about uh, the things we have to, have to do uh, to support our people, to support our community. And all of those other things that we have to do as governors, uh, the business cases, um, they're all part of us supporting our people. And our community of um, um, Te Aumohau, um, they need this support. And that includes Hanana, Shana. Um, you know, working in the um, educational sector for uh, uh, a number of years, uh, we were able to you know, support our, our, our families and taking them to the, the pools and Taitoko uh, and also into, and also Te Awaho. and um, so a lot of the things that um, in my mind is really about the well-being of our people um, and I know that within within Hanana even though you know we've got a small pool there but you know that that's it's, it's got a lot lifespan and, and all of us know that <laughs> um, and we need, need to be able to um, uh, put this, uh, support this, uh, um, well, that's what I'm saying, is be able to support, you know, the, the well-being of our people. And that's, um, I, I take the point that has been talked about to, tonight, is that this is a district-wide um, uh, investment, and e wānanga kia tēnei, the people have already spoken. The community of, of Tiawaho, they have already spoken. And I remember not long ago when the, the community of Shannon uh, had to uh, uh, had to stand up for themselves and they wanted something in, in terms of the representation review. And this table heard that unanimously. unanimously. So I'm supporting... Um, you know, this uh, uh, option one, kia ora uh, Thank you, um, Robert. Uh, look, I too am going to support option one. Um, at the time of the long-term plan, I did support the Royal Force uh, version, uh, simply for the fact that I believe that it did future-proof uh, the community uh, for uh, our growth and was supportive of that. And I understand completely regarding the finance and the, the issues and the challenges that we have. And I can still recall um, Councillor Bishop talking at some impassioned plea around another project, is when will a community get to have the nice-to-haves? And I believe this is one of those opportunities that we have now to ensure it's not even really a nice to have. It's to make sure that the building is fit for purpose uh, for our future. My regret is that we didn't make a decision in the long-term plan process that we would actually support that. And I don't want to see us again put this issue to bed and look for further consultation, which only will make the costs of the project even go further out. We made a commitment of that long-term plan to go with option two, and I re um, believe that we should do that. The community doesn't miss out. It actually gets a fit-for-purpose uh, facility that is um, able to be used appropriately. And if we had a building that could continue as to be adequate, then I'd have no um, compunction about not supporting this. But I just want to remind councillors of the, the Foxton Pool Condition Assessment. It reconfirmed the lack of building insulation and vapour barrier contributes to significant condensation and has consequential impacts on the building with durability set at five years maximum. Single glazing joinery contributes to lack of thermal performance. The ceiling walls and doors were recommended for replacement. Corrosion identified in most of the pool plant. Pool fans rusting in insufficient facility. Do we really want to support or not support a facility that has those sorts of conditional assessments? I'm sorry, but I can't, and that's why I will be supporting option one. Councillor Kaysons. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. 
Um, I too am going to be supporting option one because Councillor Allen, myself and Councillor Bishop have sat at this table long enough where officers in the past have come and requested work be done on that particular asset that Council built and due to lack of almost no support at the table back in the day, they were always forced to go and do stick and plaster options. And at times it was pretty embarrassing, I have to say. So, you know, for me, the pool, it's part of social placemaking as well. It's everything that um, everyone else in support has mentioned around community wellbeing, exercise, teaching people to swim, and it's for the whole north part of our district as well. So I am 100% behind option one. And the fact that it's a 50-year asset is actually a bonus. That's right. Thank you, Worship. Well, I'm really confused. <laughs> I um, I think this is a um, it's a pretty big decision, but it's at the same time it's it's a very hard one because I, oh, I have a foot pretty much in both camps. To be honest with you, I can see what Councillor uh, uh, Bishop is is saying. I totally agree with him. But at the same time, I, I totally agree with the Councillor Allen and uh, Councillor Brannigan. So um, I'm just going to sit back. I'm going to have to make a decision when it comes to my turn, I suppose. Um, but look, it's, it's, yeah, it's hard both ways. I, yeah, I'm not sure. That fence won't get any bigger either. <laughs> Okay, Council, oh, Council Tupapua, yeah. why did you last issue? Well, no, I think Christine hasn't spoken yet, but, um... I'd have to say, um... I would have supported option two, um... Yeah, so obviously through the RCP, it was a $9.4 million um, project um, after consultation and, and going through all the things we consider through the RTP, um, Council committed $2.6 million and went with option two so that it would still be an all-year-round all -round pool and available. But of course, um, it had some shortfalls and um, needs that bit more, which, you know, I was, after some time of, yeah, I would have leaned to option two, but, um, you know, it has to be subject to, you know, in, in my view, to uh, the, uh, a, a bit of the better off funding and the Foxton Beach freeholding account funds, um, because an extra 2.8 on top of the 2.6, which is 5.8, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it is a district decision, it's not just a, a fox then, um, yeah, as you can see, this, these decisions aren't easy, and, um, because some think, and some others, um, will miss out, and, um, well, I guess the the bigger concern for me, because, yeah, we can borrow, we can debt fund this, as well as those other um, funding options. Um, but councils, ever since I've been here, and before I ended up on here, criticised for the growing debt. But, you know, he will just, you know, the constant pushing for um, things, you just add it on, add it on. Um... Yeah, my, my concern really is what I raised earlier about the compounding operational costs. So year on year, it's 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 going to be short four hundred and twenty one thousand dollars, and um, yeah, that that doesn't get any lighter unless some some sharp cookie is going to get in there and, and generate some extra money, but. You know, if we consider that there's only like about eight, half, eight and a half thousand people 
across Kirikiri and Milanui combined, um, that's $50 per person. But as you know, if we were to consider rate funding, it, you don't do per person, it's per household or... Um, so yeah, that's 2.5. Anyway, you get my point, it just, it's quite tricky. And um, yeah, for those reasons, without being certain of, of that $2.8 million extra, how that's going to be broken up or whether the whole lot is just borrowed and added to the box. Um, I won't be supporting option one. I would have uh, linked to option two, but um, anyway, that's not the motion here. Uh, and the only other point I'd like to make is to have, I, I've struggled to reconcile where the extra $100,000 comes from because on um, page 32, we look at the contract as quote, it's 5.7, but then on the table, 6.1, page 40, it's 5.8, so how it grew a hundred thousand dollars, I don't know. Chief Executive might be able to answer that question. Um, so just adding on to what uh, Mr Harvey outlined before, given that that quote was um, given to us in April, and it has been a few months because um, we continue to be concerned with the continued escalation of price. We added an additional 100k as contingency so that we didn't have to be those council officers that came back in a month's time and said, oh no, it's gone up 100k. Councillor Mitchell. I think I'm the only person that hasn't spoken. I'm pretty much in the same mind as um, Councillor Isaacs here. My, my heart says yes, but my head says no. You know, I agree with Councillor Bishop that the long-term plan that we basically we agreed for the basic option because we were just trying to put all the pieces of the jigsaw together and make the money fit, and that that's what fitted. So I I can't see how we're going to manage to double, or nearly double, what we have to find when everything is going up in costs. It's just, every household has the same problem at the moment. Costs, cost of living is going up. What's coming in is staying the same, or in some cases going down, and you're having to make what you've got stretch further. Or you've got to cut some of those nice things out. Instead of going to Rarotonga for a holiday, you go to Foxton Beach, Mount Kemp. You know, and you, you, you have to do what you can afford to do with what you've got. Um, if I knew that Foxton Beach Freeholding was going to pay towards it, if I knew that the Three Waters funding was going to make up the shortfall, then the, those bits of the jigsaw came in, maybe I would vote to continue with the project. But at the moment, I don't have those pieces of the jigsaw, so I'm going to have to Unfortunately, I go with my head and vote no. Sorry. Councillor Allen, you'll write a reply. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I thank councillors for, for the debate. This is a toughie, you know, and, and there's certainly, for me, been a spirit of genuineness from all points of view, some big, stark differences. Uh, but this, it's it's really been project focused and uh, very honourable debate, and I mean that sincerely. Um, the the question for me is around fairness. So, I guess the the challenge back to me, and thank you, Councillor Jennings, for putting me on the spot. Quite rightly, that's that's the job of a of a right of reply. What drops off? And I guess my answer to that is. When was that ever asked over recent times about any other project? When was that a recommendation on any other project that it be referred back to the next LTP or annual plan? Why is the pool different? And if the pool is different because it's not seen as be as because it's seen as a nice to have rather than core business. Then again, I come back to the point I made 
when I opened the debate by saying our community and our communities are our core business. Swimming pools and libraries are there up there with pipes, drains, rates and rubbish. And we know this and our strategies and our documentation, our community wellbeing in particular strategy tells us this. The pool is part of council's core business. So why are we singling out the pool for reference back to the long-term plan when it's already locked in the previous long-term plan along with those other issues that are not being asked to be referred back. I, I absolutely see where, Cam, where Deputy Bear Mason is coming from around this, the uncertainties, the business case, but again, we have been at fault in not having business cases for many, many other projects. Why single out the pool? When we know, and the question has been put very strongly to, to Mr Harvey on a number of occasions about, about where did we get these figures from, and I, my mind is absolutely at peace that this has been very professionally costed, it's been QS peer reviewed, and the figures are robust. So no, we don't have a full business case, but we have some financial certainty around what we are dealing with. I do want to reinforce, um, finally, Mr Mayor, the point that was made by Councillor Brannigan, and again, it's because I guess my rebuttal is, is themed under the heading of fairness. We, myself included, agreed to extraordinary extra funding for the Horifanu Aquatic Centre, for the hydro slide, uh, the steps on the hydro slide, and for the hydrotherapy pool. That was the overwhelming decision of the council. What is different about that and the Foxton pool? I'll tell you what's different. One was nice to have staff, and the other is about a building that really is in crisis point. So if we can do it for the aquatic centre, why can't we do it for Foxton pool? So I invite councillors please to, to consider those points with an open mind and no particular pressure Councillor Isaac. <laughs>Thank you. So do we need to... Uh, no, we're going to carry on. Get this one out of the way at least. Um, we we'll, might stop after this one. Is there, there's nothing else in that report that we needed to deal with? No. So, councillors, um, we will move on. Um, we're now going to uh, 7.3, the Te Awaho Foxton Flood Mitigation Project. Uh, this is to update council on, the, on that project. Uh, the recommendation is that, uh, first of all, 3.1, 3.2, that we receive the report. And uh, the decision is, is recognised as not significant. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Deputy Mayor Mason, Councillor Mitchell, thank you. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Daniel, welcome back. Do you wish to speak to this? 
Yeah, well, the tag team up between myself and the CE. Um, obviously, Malik can provide some of that background um, around the previous decision to council on funding, and I'll speak to some of the programmed work moving forward and our involvement with the more technical aspects and shaping the ultimate delivery of the project. Um, thank you, Mr. Haig. Uh, so, councillors, um, you know, I know that the conversation uh, around the Tower Hope Foxton flood mitigation project has been something uh, that uh, has been on the agenda for some time. The, the direct purpose of this report is to allow for a resolution of council in order for me to um, essentially release the funding that has been previously committed and allocated uh, to this project. I want to particularly draw your attention to page 49 of the agenda, uh, where you will note the, um, as well as the Hurufano District Council contribution, uh, you'll note the previous commitments from this council to, re to um, contribute uh, just over $1 million towards that project, which was part of an application to central government by Horizons Regional Council, where we, in writing, committed to that funding. Uh, and you'll note that there has been one invoice already paid to the Horizons Regional Council and we have an outstanding invoice uh, from the previous financial year that they are obviously seeking uh, payment on. Uh, when you add those two invoices up, it goes above the delegations of the Chief Executive and so I'm not prepared to pay that invoice until I have resolution from this Council table. Uh, this project has, uh, has history but it also has a future and um, Mr Haig can talk to the work that is already commencing uh, around uh, a new staff member of, our, of ours um, working uh, with Horizons Regional Council to make sure that the outcomes of this project directly relate to where we see investment um, required and how we can ensure bang for buck uh, in terms of Council's contribution. Um, but also, um, you know, want to be really clear that Horizons Regional Council uh, have a have a really clear view that uh, without Council's contribution they wouldn't have applied for this funding, they wouldn't have got the funding from central government uh, and uh, right now um, are awaiting uh, for that payment to be made. Happy to answer any questions in relation to that. Councillor Jennings. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, to the CEO, um, there's quite a bit of uh, reference in the order paper, including the uh, Horizons order paper from May 2022, um, around, I'll frame it this way, their impression of HDC's total contribution. And so there is a misalignment between what is uh, provided for in our LTP, which is around a million dollars, or just over, I think, uh, million and forty seven thousand and what horizons believe should or is our proportionate contribution to what has become a escalating uh, cost in terms of uh, in scope and, and, and cost in terms of a project and so their figure in their may 2022 uh, order paper was 2.46 million uh, being 22 percent of the project cost um, I guess my question is, what's your response to that? <laughs> um, and secondly, is the contribution that we uh, have made, the million dollars, and, and any future uh, additional contribution, is that likely to be debt that would transfer uh, to Entity C in terms of the three waters reforms, or is this on us? Uh, thank you, Councillor Jennings, for your, your worship. Uh, so my response to that, Councillor Jennings, is that um, Council has only formally committed just over a million dollars to the project. I acknowledge and recognise that the Horizons Regional Council, uh, in reviewing on multiple occasions uh, the scope of this project, have done some calculations where they have assumed what HDC's uh, contribution will be, and I understand there has been conversation between our council and Horizons Regional Council on what they'd like our contribution to be, but certainly in any conversation I've been part of in the last couple of months, they know very clearly what is in our LTP, what is allocated, 
and that um, you know, in the absence of, of us closer to the project with further clarity on um, what would be the additional benefit uh, all the additional savings that could be made through our contribution towards that project. Um, there is certainly, um, you know, have obviously shared this paper with uh, the regional council where I've been very upfront with them that I'm not recommending uh, additional funds. This is about allocating the funds that had been allocated through the long-term plan um, because they have not formally requested that additional funding. And um, I, I think that you know Mr. Haig might be able to speak to probably the opportunities ahead for us to be closer with the, to the project, working in partnership, um, and through that hopefully um, being able to achieve um, some savings or some uh, diff a different way of looking at it in terms of scope. So sorry, the second part of your question around the amount. Um, so uh, sort advice from the team, and we would, so our the current just over $1 million, which I'm asking you to endorse for release today, uh, we would consider that funding against our three waters assets, um, mostly related to stormwater. So our expectation is it would go on our balance sheet, and then it would obviously go over to Entity C when three waters reform occurs. When we come to give you, if and when we come to give you additional advice in the future about an additional allocation, uh, obviously we would look to provide you that similar advice around how do we ensure it's um, tied to three waters debt that will then go on the balance sheet of Entity C. Sorry, just a supplementary, if that's okay. Um, so based on your responses, in terms of, um, I guess the concern I have is that if there is ongoing dispute about that difference between what Horizons believes our contribution should be and where we've settled on at the moment, and there is no more money from Horizons or any other source, then inevitably that's going to affect project scope. And so I guess my question is, do you see that as being important uh, in terms of our decision making about whether to pay the, the remaining $300,000 because we're still lacking some clarity around exact, exactly what the project scope is and will deliver without that additional funding potentially. So is it, it, are you comfortable with us making that payment of $300,000 with that uncertainty hanging over our head in terms of difference in, in contribution? I, I'm not sure if I would describe it as a dispute between the two organisations um, around our contribution. I think um, what I would describe it as is a desire from Horizons Regional Council for this council to make a higher allocation. But as I say, there has been no formal request from Horizons um, for that additional funding. Uh, I'd be uncomfortable if we didn't release the funding, and that's because this council made a commitment in our long-term plan. We've been a partner to the project, and we could have done a better job in participating in that project to date. Um, I'm really confident in the work that Mr Hiddleston is leading now um, in participating in that work, uh, and so you know, I think it's important that we demonstrate that the commitment we made when this funding was applied for to government uh, that um, Horizons Regional Council can rely on us uh, as a funding partner for important things. Councillor Browning. Yeah, thank you. Just, just to add to that, um, the project is, as you read in the report, the project is already underway. There's already work being done um, that mitigates some of the risk to the Foxing community along the Kings Canal and some of the big culverts that have been replaced. So um, it's not, not as if there's, there's nothing being done yet. Um, if the, if the uh, project stopped for whatever reason um, in 12 months' time or six months' time, there has already been some improvements that we, we have got, the, the community are benefiting, benefiting from already. So just to provide some clarity and assurance. Thanks. Any further questions? Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, recommendation 3.3 that Council approve the Chief Executive to release the full funding of 1047000 
allocated and long term plan to the Aoho Fox and Flood Mitigation Project. Do I have a move and a second? Moved by Councillor Brannigan, second by Councillor Jennings. Any further discussion? Councillor Jennings. Look, I, I just wanted to say that um, um, I, I, I support this project. I think, it's, I think it's important. I definitely think it's important. Um, and so I don't want my questions to be misconstrued as, as being anti the project. For me, um, the the thing that I really want us to have an eye on is 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 this future or this this expectation or desire for additional funding and and, and I'm confident that there'll be some robust discussion around that. So thanks. Well, there certainly has been robust discussion about this matter over a number of years. Um, so the motion is on the table. Um, all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. So um, I know that it's getting time is getting on, but I would like to deal with this matter before we break for dinner. Uh, so 7.4 on page 69, the proposed liquefaction assessment policy approach. Um, can I move uh, recommendation 3.1 and 3.2? The report be received. Move Deputy Mayor Mason, seconded. Someone look at me, please. Councillor Isaacs, thank you. Um, all those in favour? Against? Carried. So welcome David and Megan. Thank you. You wish to uh, add anything to the report? Good evening, Worship and Councillors. Um, as you'll see on the report, we are seeking adoption of a liquefaction policy approach and a range of decisions for Council around that approach. Um, we are, with this, we are seeking to provide a pathway for building consents that are currently on hold for liquefaction assessments. These options present a balance between a permissive approach that's in accordance with statutory requirements and also balancing residual risk. Um, I haven't got anything further to add, but I am happy to address some of the points that some of the speakers raised, if you worship. Um, Bruce, yes. So um, with regards to the comment from a speaker around the use of the term reasonable grounds in the report, that relates back to section 49 of the building code, um, which I'll paraphrase, says the BCA must be, um, must grant a building consent if it is reasonably satisfied, sorry, satisfied on reasonable grounds that the provisions of the building code will be met. So it's a direct um, quote out of the Building Act. Um, with regards to the other comments around the risk, difference in risk associated with um, larger developments that um, have a denser housing intensity, um, the, while it, there isn't more of a risk of liquefaction occurring, it relates to um, the fact that if that liquefaction is localised and you have a higher density of housing, um, there is a the damage that it could cause and the risk associated with that is, is higher. Um, and with regards to the point from the other speaker around hydrology assessments and groundwater, um, groundwater is something that's taken into consideration both in um, liquefaction assessments in general, um, in the proposed screening tool, and it's also used as part of the assessment in relation to liquefaction mapping. So it is a pulls big part of this. Um, that's all I have to comment on, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Megan. Any questions for me or don't? Councillor Mitch. Thank you. So um, the idea that we go out and we get a desktop assessment so that we can map the district basically, and have more certainty about where the areas are that are possible or unlikely. Um, I'm just clarifying that, that that's not going to be any more ground testing. So do we have enough data across the district to actually be able to come up with a map that is actually going to be, you know, reasonably certain, useful? Do we have enough of that data already? 
the technical experts have uh, put together the proposal to undertake that work um, and doing what there's different levels of testing. Uh, they've proposed to do a, a level A slash B assessment, which is largely a desktop assessment. It would involve drawing on uh, quite a bit of information, information that already exists from other um, CPT testing that's been done throughout the, the district. So again, depending on where that is, that will help shape some of their information, groundwater information, um, also forms part of part of that, as well as their understanding of the the district in terms of their geomorphology and so on. So they are confident that they can give us a map which will uh, essentially colour in the uh, the bits that are blank at the moment. Uh, but in terms of going to the what that may identify that there's some areas where there'll be benefits for us to, to go and do additional level of testing at a more site specific level. But really, you need to do that first level of testing first to actually understand where you would actually get value from going and then spending money on a, a more the deeper ground testing or more site specific testing. So, so the map that we've got at the moment, it's just basically the townships and, and some villages, right? Is, is this map that they're going to come up with be the whole district that's going to be rural as well? That's correct. So the, the current liquefaction maps are based on the, the townships and future growth areas that were assessed um, when the work was undertaken. The plan is to, to come back with a map that essentially colours in the, the rest of the district, uh, so that would include the rural areas. Councillor Browning. Thanks, Rang and David. Um, listen, in terms of um, more in-depth testing that you just mentioned, David, and someone's applying for a consent, building consent, resort consent, whatever it might be, what would the trigger points be to activate that um, that further testing or more in-depth testing of a particular site? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think to some extent that depends on which of these policy approaches council chooses to adopt. Um, so under the MB guidance, which I think is, sorry, I'm not going to guess off the top of my head, I think option two, um, that requires deep ground investigations for all sites that aren't identified as unlikely, low or very low risk of liquefaction. If we're looking at the proposed screening tool, um, then that provides a pathway for areas of the district that are mapped as um, possible or undetermined. In some cases, if a site comes out as being high risk of liquefaction, there may need to be some deeper on-site investigations required to inform the appropriate foundation design. Um, outside of that, with the, the screening tool, it would generally be the areas that are unmapped that would need the deeper ground investigations in this case. David, in terms of... Um the report from Tom and Taylor, you, have they done other assessments at other councils in terms of this subject? And I suppose I'm asking, are we out of sync with any other our neighbouring councils? Are, are we reasonably comfortable as to where we sit with this in relation to that? Because I know builders and developers will be working across boundaries rather than uh, defined areas. So I just want to be comfortable that we're not out of sync with this. Um, so this is one of the, the areas that there will be a lot of gen, um, variation between districts or regions depending on who undertook the, the mapping and how it was undertaken. So for example, some of our neighbouring councils have undertaken mapping to a high level of detail, um, in which case a lot of the testing that people are having to do on site on sites here for building consents, a lot of the, the background work has already been done. Um, so the, there is that variation, it is fairly unavoidable. Um, from my understanding, um, it is more and more councils are trying to work with, sorry, more and more councils who have done the level of mapping that we have, where there are, you know, where it's broken down to um, possible, unlikely, undetermined. Um, more councils are going to Tonkin and Taylor and they are working with them on putting in screening approaches. Um, 
because it will allow a bit of a more permissive approach. Probably just do. We'll just, just wait for the music interlude to uh, finish. Just, just to add to that, I think what I would say is yes, this uh, Tom and Taylor have done work for other other councils. We are comfortable with the uh, approach that has been taken. The geomorphology does vary across the country, so ultimately you will end up with different responses as well. Um, but councillors may also recall a previous briefing where we have actually identified in a table form sort of how our approach um, sits with other, other councils. And so the approach we have been taking, and, and again, continue to try um, put forward as an option here, sits at that more permissive end um, than what uh, some other councils are, are doing. Any further questions? Councillor Kerry. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, just concerning uh, your consultation with Iwi about those cultural sites, so what sort of plan going forward and how are you going to do that? Could you just ask that again, please? Just asking about the, the plan going forward when you go consult with Iwi in terms of those those cultural sites that will be um, identified, um, you know, through through that uh, whole program that you're, you're proposing. Um, what what is the plan in terms of consultation? So, Councillor Keto, I think if I heard the question right, um, you're you're wanting to understand um, a how this was applied to sites of wahitapu or cultural significance, um, but also how we can give you assurances that um, when we when there are matters of cultural significance, what the relationship looks like uh, with iwi hapu, uh, and I think what's important to um, kind of highlight to the table is that. If council endorsed the approach tonight, you know that's a that's a policy setting for all land, um, uh, and so the requirements around liquefaction um, in our policies policy settings would be required uh, across all land. Um, but certainly, you know, when when that is a site of cultural significance or a wahitapu site, council Kito, uh, obviously we would be having conversations with Marae. Hapu, Iwi, and seeking their guidance and endorsement, particularly in reference to our cultural monitoring protocol requirements. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, David. So, um, the recommendation 3.3 then is that Council adopts policy C from the report Options for Liquefaction Assessment in Horofanua District. 30th of May 2022, as part of the Council's liquefaction policy approach. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Councillor Brannigan, seconded Councillor Allen. Any further debate or discussion? Three point three. Put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. So we now move to 3.4, which there is an either or. So the council agrees to treat individual building consent applications under option three from the report Options for Liquefaction Assessment in Horofano District, 30th of May 2022, as part of the council's liquefaction policy approach, or the council agrees to apply options one to three in accordance with the development scenario from the report options for liquefaction assessment in Horofana District 30th of May 2022 as part of the Council's liquefaction policy approach. Does anyone understand that? Yeah. Not really. Does everyone? Maybe we should ask David to come back to the table and just give us an explanation as to what that actually means. Or Megan? Sorry to send you away and bring you back like that. Uh, 
Um, sorry, Your Worship. Um, so the first option is that individual building consents uh, are treated just um, basically they can be we can use the screening tool when they fall into the right areas of mapping. The other option, which is essentially what's presented um, by Tonkin and Taylor in that, is that we have to look at where that building consent sits in relation to the larger development it might be in. So for example, if somebody is building a house that's part of a um, relatively um, high density subdivision, um, and, and they might be the first house, they might be the last house in that subdivision, um, we would have to look at, um, at the fact that they're in the larger subdivision and treat them less permissively because of that higher risk that's associated with um, applying this on a larger scale in a, in a particular area. So that's essentially the difference between the two. I'm happy to answer any further questions if anyone has any about that. So, so Brian, yeah, so that option one, option, sorry, uh, First one. First one provides um, satisfies the MB guidance rules, but also gives us that uh, streamlined approach that we're looking for in terms of, of that development. Will that be will that be fair sort of summation? That is our understanding, yes. Add to that David. Oh, okay. So is everyone comfortable with that explanation? Are there any further questions? Can I just ask in relation to because it was paragraph six point two point three that like it explains kind of the difference to me like it, that was it captures it there and so it's that last sentence that reads however until this is routinely, routinely applied at the subdivision stage there will be properties where this level of information isn't available and therefore the perfection assessments will need be will be needed at building consent is there so the question I was left thinking was, is, is there sort of a transitional approach where, because you, you're saying that at a subdivision level, that it'll be more onerous, there's more cost, there's, but it's at, the, it's, it's at the front end rather than being at the back end in terms of building consent. Is there a transitional approach where there's people that are part of subdivisions now where we can apply the less onerous but where if it's a new subdivision, you take that more of that front end approach. Does that make sense? Yes, that's essentially what this would allow. Um, we're initially trying to use this proposed approach to to make to allow building consents to continue, but it can be supply, um, can be applied at subdivision level. And if there are more in depth investigations done at subdivision level then that could reduce the amount of investigation required at building consent stage. But as you say, it would take a while for that to catch up once applied. Yes, yeah, so we don't actually need to provide for a specific transitional approach because it's already, it's that will naturally, organically occur. Yeah. Okay, um, could I then have um, someone move either or 3.41 that'll do okay so I move around Councillor Brannigan anyone prepared to second that Councillor Kay Simmons thank you any further discussion just very briefly if you wish um, yes, you know, this stuff's terribly technical we, we know that, and we're, we're looking at it. Um, we've talked, we've been through workshops. We've uh, quizzed the team for um, a myriad of time to to get an understanding of this, and I think a lot of people are still struggling with it. Um, but along, along with the question asked around the guidance rules from MB, which this satisfies, um, we're not we've accepted ninety fifth percentile. We know the, um, the some of the, the risks and the hazards in our, in our in our community. That's part of living in New Zealand. Um, and the best way we can do it is mitigate the best we can, but also uh, still promote and uh, allow for, for growth um, without um, making costs so prohibitive, prohibitive that uh, we can't build new, more houses in New Zealand. So it's, it's, some, it's I guess it's somewhat of, of a risk um, appetite approach. 
and I think I think the team have, have struck it pretty well, and I thank them for the work they've done on it because it's it's simply not an easy area. We'll all have our personal views and public will have personal views, but I think it strikes the right mix um, and addresses that risk appetite, risk it, and uh, to, to to the right level. Um, thank you. Okay, so recommendation 3.4.1 is on the table. Uh, all those in favour? Against? Carried, thank you. Um, 3.5, we will do 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 and 3.8 individually as well. Um, 3.5, the Council agrees to the new Council guidance being applied from 1 September 2022 and that this supersedes the use of the current interim council guidance. Over from Councillor Mitchell, second from Councillor Allen. Any further discussion? Put the motion, all those in favour? Thank, against? Carried, thank you. 3.6, that council agrees to accept liquefaction assessments from CPE engine, or CP engineering structural engineers for the simplified screening approach. Mover, Councillor Allen, seconded Councillor Isaacs. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Against? Carry, thank you. 3.7, the Council supports in principle the approach of a consent fee rebate being provided to applicants where new CPT data from their consent application is uploaded to the New Zealand Geotechnical Database. Officers are asked to prepare a report for Council to consider that sets out the processes and associated cost implications. Moved Councillor Brannigan, seconded Councillor Tukapua. No further discussion. Put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carry. Thank you. And 3.8. Council approves officers proceeding with the additional liquefaction assessment and mapping to complete the district liquefaction, liquefaction map and that this work be funded from within existing operational budgets. Move from Councillor Mitchell, seconded from Councillor Isaacs. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think this is an opportune time now to take a meal break. Uh, we will resume at six fifty. We'll resume at twenty past seven. Thank you. Uh, for those uh, members of the public uh, that wish to remain, there is some refreshments out in the foyer. If you want to remain after our meal break, thank you. Meeting is adjourned.